So we had finished last week with the idea that electrons, if they behave as waves, can be described by a new type of mathematics called wave mechanics, where we treat the electrons as waves. And if you solve what's called the Schrodinger equation, solutions to that equation give you highly probable regions of space in an atom where electrons can be found. And we call those orbitals. And there's many solutions to the Schrodinger equation, which just means atoms have many orbitals in them where their electrons can be. And if you look at all the solutions of the Schroeder equation in totality, you can see that orbitals can be organized in different ways. And we're gonna go through that today. The most basic and fundamental way to organize orbitals in an atom is by what energy level they're in. Now, what do I mean by an energy level? It's almost like a Bohr orbit, first, second, third Bohr orbit. Those orbits have different energies because they're different distances from the nucleus. So an energy level is a group of orbitals that have the same energy because they're the same distance from the nucleus. So in terms of the Schrodinger model of the hydrogen atom, we're gonna identify a term called an energy level. And that's just gonna be a group of orbitals that have the same average distance from the nucleus. So if you're in the first energy level, those are orbitals that are really, really close to the nucleus. So if we draw a picture of an orbital in the first energy level, it's gonna be really, really small because a small orbital would have to, by definition, have its electron close to the nucleus. If I was gonna draw a picture of an orbital in the second energy level, that orbital would be bigger because on the average, an electron in this orbital is on the average further from the nucleus. An orbital in the third energy level would be even bigger. And we could continue this as far as we want. So all the orbitals in an atom can be broken up into categories based upon how far they are from the nucleus. The orbitals that are close make up the first energy level. Orbitals that are further are the second, even further are the third, even further are the fourth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, each of these orbitals can be designated with a numerical designation. So the orbitals that are in the first energy level we use n equals one, which is very similar to the Bohr model where we said the first orbit in the hydrogen atom was the n equals one first Bohr orbit. We use the same notation here. So orbitals in the first energy level are denoted n equals one. Second energy level, n equals two. Third energy level, n equals three, etc. Now the electrons in these orbitals are not moving around on the outside of those spherical orbitals. They're located in the volume of the spherical orbital themselves. They're on the interior. And when they move around in the interior, they do not move around evenly throughout the interior of each of those orbitals. They have inside of them what are called radial nodes. And a radial node is a sphere inside of an orbital that has no electron probability. And we're gonna take a look on the inside of each of these three orbitals and try to show you <clears throat> what that means. So if I take my first orbital and I cut it open and we look on the inside, I'm gonna show color-wise, orange color where there's high probability of finding the electron and then fading to white color where there's no probability. So right here in the nucleus, the color inside there is white. That means you can't find the electron right at the nucleus. But as you start moving away from the nucleus, now the color turns to pink. There's high probability of finding the electron here, and then you move to the end of the orbital and it's white, okay? So if we look at the next one, we have no probability at the nucleus, then we reach a region, a sphere, where there is probability of finding the electron, and then we get to a region that's white. You can't find the electron at this distance from the nucleus. That's called a radial node. And that, and all of a sudden, electrons probably really, really high again. So in the interior, orbital, the electron is not distributed evenly. It has regions of high probability, and then it has what's called a radial node, a region of no probability. And then this one, there's a region of high probability close, then a node, then a region of high probability further away. If we look at the n equals three orbital, this is even more complex. The electron is never found right at the nucleus, but it is found in a sphere a little bit further away. Then you have a radial node where there's no probability. Then you can find the electron again, and then there's another radial node, and then you find the electron again. So the interior of these orbitals actually has some complexity to them. And what I wanna draw is called a radial probability distribution for these. So I wanna show what's the probability of finding the electron as you move from the nucleus to the right or from the nucleus to the left. 
So there's no probability of the nucleus, then there's high probability, then it goes down to zero. Going the other direction, no probability of the nucleus, high probability, then it goes down to zero when you get outside the orbital. So graphing the distance from the nucleus on the y-axis, right and left, no probability of the nucleus, high probability at that orange region there, and then it drops down to zero as you go outside the orbital. So if I draw the radial probability distribution both to the right and the left, you're always going to get a perfectly symmetrical graph like this. So people don't draw it going left and right. They only draw it going to the right. So this would be considered the radial probability distribution of the electron in this first energy level orbital. You can't find it near the nucleus. There's no probability. But there's high probability this intermediate distance. And then when you get to the end of the orbital and extend out, there's no probability. Okay, that is a radial probability distribution. A graph for an orbital plotting the probability of finding the electron in it versus distance from the nucleus. Let's see how the diagram would look for this one, the more complex. You'd start at the nucleus, zero probability. Then you'd have high probability, then zero probability, then high probability, then zero probability. And does the same thing in the other direction, zero, high, zero, high, zero. So the probability distribution along the y-axis, both left and right, would show two humps because there's two orange regions, regions inside that orbital as you move away from the nucleus where you find the electron and you've got that one little region there where there's zero probability that represents the white node. And once again, if we only draw this pointing to the right instead of the right and the left, then the radial probability distribution for this second energy level orbital looks like this. There's one hump, then a node, then a bigger hump, it turns out. The little further rate region has a lot higher probability than the closer region, okay? For this one, let's see if we can imagine what that would look like. Zero at the beginning, then a hump, then zero, then a hump, then a zero, then a hump, and then zero. And it does the same thing both directions. Zero, high probability, zero probability, high probability, zero probability, high probability, and then it continues on to zero. So the graph of the radial probability distribution for this one has three humps with two, nodal, uh, two radial nodes there. If we only draw it going one direction, then it winds up looking like this. So these are called radial probability distributions. And before the period's over, it's going to come back and this interior uh, complexity is going to actually be important for a couple of concepts. But I just wanted you to understand that before we go on so you can see the pictures of that. So the first way to, rep to organize orbitals in an atom is by energy level, how far they are from the nucleus. So if you are in a particular energy level and pick any one you want, like maybe the second energy level, well, an energy level can have multiple orbitals in it. There can't, doesn't just have to be one orbital in an energy level. It can be a whole group of orbitals. And when you're in a particular energy level, the orbitals in that energy level can be broken down by sublevels. So orbitals in an energy level can be organized by sublevels. So a sublevel is a group of orbitals in an energy level that have some characteristic shape to them. And as we'll see eventually, they also have some characteristic number of nodal planes. But more importantly, a sublevel is just a group of orbitals with the same characteristic shape in a given energy level. <clears throat> when you graph solutions to the Schrodinger equation, the orbitals do not always come out spherical. I've only drawn spherical orbitals for you so far, but orbitals can have different shapes because things that have wave type phenomenon can wind up making different standing wave patterns. That's almost like what an orbital is. So many orbitals we've seen and do exist in the hydrogen atom are spherical in shape. If you have a spherically shaped orbital, we call that an S orbital. So many orbitals are spherically in shape. So a group of orbitals in an energy level that are spherical are said to be in the S sublevel. But when you graph the Schrodinger equation, sometimes you get an orbital whose picture looks like this, has a high region of probability above the nucleus and another high region of probability below the nucleus, but nothing on the side. That's kind of like a dumbbell it looks like what you use in the weight room, right? So these are called P orbitals. So there will be groups of P orbitals in particular energy levels. They make what's called the P sublevel. Other pictures of orbitals that are solutions of the Schrodinger equation wind up having a four-leaf clover look to them. 
these orbitals are called d orbitals. And so that anything that looks like this would be a member of the d sublevel of a particular energy level. And you can add even more complex ones. There are f orbitals. They have this characteristic eight leaf clover shape to them. <clears throat> and there's actually more and more complex uh, looking orbitals past that. These are the only four I would like you to know what their name is and what their characteristic shape is. So S orbitals are spherical, P orbitals are dumbbell, D orbitals are four leaf clover, F orbitals are eight leaf clover. The names come from spectroscopic work, S for sharp, P for principal, D for diffuse, F for fundamental. So it, they don't seem to make any rhyme or reason. So you just might have to make up something for yourself like a little mnemonic or something like shams, punts, deflated footballs to remember them. But you'll need to know the shapes that go along with them. For sublevels past the F sublevel, they just do them alphabetically. So the sublevels go S, P, D, F, then G, H, I, J. And if you take a look at the pictures, you want to make a guess as to what a G orbital would look like? Anybody? 16 leaf clover? Yeah, one, two, four, eight, 16. That's exactly right. So you could probably find pictures of those on Wikipedia if you looked it up, okay? Now, something else that comes from the Schrodinger equation is that when you have an S, P, D, or F sublevel, that always contains the exact same number of orbitals. So for example, oh, oh, let me say one more thing before I say that, sorry. So a sublevel is a group of orbitals with a characteristic shape, but it also has a characteristic number of nodal planes. A nodal plane, or what's sometimes called an angular node, is a plane through the orbital where there's no electron probability. It's like taking this picture here and taking a piece of cardboard, which is like a plane. Can I slide that piece of cardboard into this picture and separate that orbital into two parts where between those two parts, there's a region of zero probability. This orbital is perfectly symmetrical. It does not have a nodal plane in it, but this one does. Look at the P orbitals. Could you imagine taking a piece of cardboard and sliding it into the picture so it actually separates the regions of probability. So there's a spot between those regions of probability where there's no electrons found. Look at this. See that little gray piece of cardboard there? I can slide that right between the top node and the bottom node. So p orbitals always have one nodal plane in them. The s orbitals have zero nodal planes. The p orbitals have one nodal plane. How many nodal planes, how many pieces of cardboard can you slide in here between each of those lobes? What do you think? Slide that cardboard. Somebody said three. Oh, too many. It isn't three. Look at this. You can slide one here, slide one there. It's actually just two. Miss Spears is correct. So D orbitals actually have two nodal planes in them. The F orbitals, I didn't, couldn't find a picture for this one, but it's actually three nodal planes. So each of these different types of orbital shapes actually have a corresponding number of nodal planes that go in them, and they go zero, one, two, three, et cetera, okay? <clears throat> now, what I was gonna say before, but I actually went too quickly, is that each of these sublevels have a particular number of orbitals are in them. Whenever you have an S sublevel, there's always gonna be one of these spherical orbitals making up the entire S sublevel. S orbitals always come in groups of one. P orbitals, however, are different. They always come in groups of three. D orbitals always come in groups of five. F orbitals always come in groups of seven. G orbitals would always come in groups of? Nine. So even though you're not solving the Schrodinger equation, these are the patterns that develop from and it's fairly easy to follow. So you now should be able to predict how many orbitals there are in any given sublevel. F sublevel always has seven orbitals. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually look at the patterns that are developed from the Schrodinger equation to let you sort of visualize how electrons can be organized in atoms. So I'm gonna look at the first four energy levels of an atom we're going to see how many sublevels exist in each of these energy levels. We'll count up how many orbitals are in each of these energy levels, and then we'll eventually count up the number of electrons that can fit, fit in them. So from the solutions to the Schrodinger equation, 
anytime you have the first energy level of an atom, and that's, let's say, a solution of the Schrodinger equation, there's always only one sublevel. So the first energy level does not have multiple sublevels. It only has one sublevel, the S sublevel. Now, how many orbitals does the S sublevel have? How many orbitals are there in an S sublevel? That would be one. So therefore, the whole first energy level of an atom has one orbital in it. That's all. That's the first energy level. That's the only energy level that constitutes an, just uh, one orbital. We go to the second energy level, though. Solutions to the Schrodinger equation tell us there are two sublevels. And those two sublevels are the S and the P. So in the second energy level now, how many orbitals are there? There's one S orbital and there's three P orbitals. So the second energy level of an atom, we believe, has a total of four orbitals in it. The third energy level, solutions to the Schrodinger equation, allow us to have three sublevels, the S, the P, and the D. The S sublevel is one orbital, the P is three, the D is five, so that means the third energy level of an atom has nine orbitals in it. Fourth energy level of an atom, maybe you're seeing the pattern here, has four sublevels. So each of these four different sublevels provides solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So S, P, D, and F sublevels exist in the fourth energy level. So the number of orbitals in the fourth energy level are one plus three plus five plus seven, 16. If you understand the pattern, then what I will ask you is I will say for the nth energy level, how many sublevels are there in the nth energy level and how many orbitals are in the nth energy level? So how many sublevels should there be in the nth energy level? Five. Say it again. Five. That would only be for the fifth energy level. But if I say the nth energy level, which is a variable, you can't say there would be five sublevels. You have to give me a variable as an answer. And it would be n. So you notice whatever energy level you're in, that's how many sublevels there are. So if you're in the nth energy level, you would have n sublevels. Does that make sense? How many orbitals would you have in the nth energy level? N. Uh, one to the mm, not n. 1, 4, 9, and 16 don't equal 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's n squared because you always have the addition of consecutive odd integers to add up to the total number of orbitals in a sublevel. And it turns out that the addition of consecutive odd integers always makes a perfect square. So it turns out the number of orbitals in an energy level is always whatever the energy level is squared. So if you're in the ninth energy level, there would be nine sublevels and there'd be 81 orbitals, okay? Now, if you remember from last week, the very last thing we said was that an orbital is a region of space that can hold two electrons as long as they're spinning in opposite directions. So if the first energy level has one orbital and that orbital can hold two electrons, the first energy level could hold two electrons. The second energy level has four orbitals, so it can hold eight electrons. Third energy level has nine orbitals, it could hold 18. The fourth energy level has 16 orbitals, it can hold 32. These are not consecutive numbers. There's two electrons in the first energy level Eight could be in the second, so if you fill the first and the second, you've used 10. If you fill the first, second, and third, you've used 28. If you fill the first, second, third, and fourth, that can hold 60 electrons, so just so you understand that. How do you get the number of electrons in an energy level? You just take the number of orbitals and you multiply it by two. It'd be 2n squared, okay? Now, <clears throat> when you look at the periodic table, and you look at a particular element on the periodic table like hydrogen, there's a number at the top of that hydrogen box. And for hydrogen, that number is one. That tells how many protons are in a hydrogen atom. It also tells how many electrons there are. Hydrogen atoms have one electron. So quite often, if I ask somebody, how many orbitals are in a hydrogen atom? People will tell me one because it has one electron. But that's actually not true. There's not one orbital. There's lots of orbitals in a hydrogen atom. It would be like if after class day, you went to Angel Stadium. Angel Stadium, if you walked in there, you'd be the only one there because there's no baseball going on. And if you walked in, you might want to sit in one of the seats there. And you know how many seats there are in Angel Stadium? 45,050. So if you go into Angel Stadium and you sit, let's say, right here, okay, 
and I ask you how many seats are in Angel Stadium, you don't say one, just one of them's occupied. There's still 45,050 seats in the stadium, but you're only occupying one of them. A hydrogen atom has one electron, but is there only one orbital in the hydrogen atom? No, there's all these orbitals we just talked about, the ones in the first energy level, second, third, and fourth, it's just most of them are empty, okay? So all these orbitals exist, but the electron and hydrogen can only occupy one orbital at a time. So one orbital is occupied, lots of them are empty. So if we go through all these orbitals that exist, according to Schrodinger in a hydrogen atom, and we're gonna assume they're the orbitals that exist in atoms of all other elements as well. If we start with the first energy level, the whole first energy level is a single S orbital. And because an orbital can hold two electrons, the first energy level of a hydrogen atom could hold two electrons if it had two, okay? Now, I wanna identify how you name this orbital. And the way we name an orbital is we name it by stating the energy level it's in and then the sublevel it's in. So if this orbital is in the first energy level, I'm gonna say one. If it's in the S sublevel, I'm gonna say S and I'm gonna say them right after each other, one S. That's it. That's the name of the orbital in the first energy level. What does this orbital look like? Spherical. Yeah. Perfect. So the S is what tells you the shape. You know what the one tells you? Small, because it's close to the nucleus. So the energy level just tells you how big the orbital is. So this would be the smallest possible, so small. Kind of hard to draw small though, when you're, but you can certainly draw the shape and I draw it spherical. That's what the uh, orbital looks like in the first energy level, okay? We go to the second energy level as we just deduced, the second energy level can have two sublevels, S and P. So there's gonna be one S orbital in the second energy level and there's gonna be three P orbitals in the second energy level. That's four orbitals altogether. Four orbitals multiplied by two could hold eight electrons. So that means that the second energy level of an atom would hold eight electrons if you completely filled its second energy level. So we're gonna to wanna to draw pictures and name each of the orbitals that exist in the second energy level. So the first orbital that exists is an S orbital. It's in the second energy level. So what's its name gonna be? 2S. That's the energy level and that's the sublevel. The S means it's spherically shaped. The two tells me how am I gonna draw this compared to the one S that you just drew before. How's this picture compared to the picture of the one S? It's the dumbbell? No, because the S orbital always means spherical. Okay, so it's an S orbital, you can draw a sphere. You drew the one S as a sphere also, they kind of look the same, but this one has to be different in one property. What properties are gonna be different? It's gonna be bigger because it's in a higher energy level. Does that make sense, Mr. Gomez? So when you go to the second energy level, the orbitals are bigger, and so this is just a bigger sphere than what you drew before, okay? Then we're gonna have three different P orbitals in the second energy level because they always come in groups of three. One of the P orbitals will point its two lobes along the X axis. Another will point its two lobes along the Y axis and another will point its two lobes across the Z axis. This is an important point in relationship to wave type phenomenon. If the electrons are creating standing wave patterns and you have this P sublevel, what they're gonna do is they're gonna arrange the different P orbitals around the nucleus to perfectly evenly spread out the electron probability. So it puts two lobes of probability on the X axis, two on the Y, two on the Z, perfect symmetry. That's why these P orbitals always come in groups of three. Now, unfortunately, these names are all identical. So that's kind of hard if you wanna talk about one compared to the other. So what they'll sometimes do is they'll add a subscript after the P to indicate which axes that the P orbitals are pointing on. So here, this P orbital is on the X axis. So sometimes more specifically, it's referred to as the 2PX. This one's the 2PY, this one's the 2PZ. But these four orbitals constitute the second energy level. The 1S orbital is small. These all four orbitals are bigger. They're all about the same size. They're the same energy level because of the same distance from the nucleus, but they have different shapes, okay? These four orbitals make up the second energy level 
of a hydrogen atom. The third energy level would have three sublevels, an S sublevel, a P sublevel, and a D sublevel. And the S sublevel always has one orbital, the P sublevel always has three orbitals, and the D sublevel always has five orbitals. So therefore you add that up, that's nine orbitals altogether, making up the third energy level of any atom. Nine orbitals times two could hold 18 electrons, so the third energy level is capable of holding 18 electrons in it. Now, what do these orbitals look like? There's going to be one round orbital, three dumbbell-shaped orbitals, and then five four-leaf clover-shaped orbitals. So if I'm going to draw them, the first one I'm going to draw is the s orbital. Its name will be the 3s. And what's it going to look like? Exactly like the 1s and the 2s, except it will be bigger. So the 3s orbital is going to be a sphere. If you're trying these pictures relative to what you've done before in your notes, this one better be a bigger one because the third energy level is a group of orbitals that are on the average further from the nucleus, so it's got to be bigger. The p orbitals are the 3px, 3py, 3pz, because they're in the third energy level now. They'll look exactly like the 2px, 2py, and 2pz, except they're going to be bigger because they're in the third energy level. Okay, good so far on that? And then we have the D sublevel. So there's going to be five additional orbitals that are the same distance from the nucleus as these guys, just they have four leaf clover shape to them. So there'll be five different 3D orbitals. Let's go through those. There'll be a four leaf clover shape. And when we're done, these five orbitals will actually cause the electron probability to be spread perfectly symmetrical around the nucleus. So if you're really into symmetry, you're really going to like this and appreciate that a lot. So the first one is a four-leaf clover that puts the lobes of electron probability on the xy plane. So we could actually rename this the 3D xy, so you know you're specifically talking about the four-leaf clover shaped orbital that's on the xy plane. You could have a four-leaf clover shaped orbital on the xz plane. It would look like this. It's the same shape, only it's tilted on a different plane. So this would be called the 3D XZ, or you could have it on the YZ plane. So if you actually draw the four leaf clover shape on the YZ plane, you have another four leaf clover shaped D orbital, but to be specific, you call it the 3D YZ, okay? These actually spread the electron probability perfectly symmetrically around the nucleus, but there's still two more orbitals to go. So there's gotta be two other places to put electrons. So where would they be? I want you to notice this middle one right here, okay? Look at where the lobes of electron probability are. They're not pointing directly on the two axes. They're pointing out into the what? What are those called? Think back to algebra geometry days. Those are called the planes. Mm, they're on a plane, but they're not pointing into the planes. They're pointing into the, this is one, two, three, four. What were those called? Quadrants. Quadrants. Remember that? So these three different d orbitals have the electron probabilities perfectly symmetrically arranged, pointing into all the possible quadrants. The last two have the electron probabilities pointing directly on the axes. Look at this one and compare it to the one at the very top. It's on the xy plane, but the top one has the four lobes pointing to the quadrants on the xy plane. This shifts it over slightly and puts it right on the x and y axis. So it's a little bit different region. We could call that the 3dxy, but that's the same name as above. So it's given a slightly different name, but still indicating it's on the xy plane. It's called the 3d x squared minus y squared. So for those of you that are good at symmetry, there's only one other place an orbital can be pointing. Where does it have to be pointing to wind up being perfectly symmetrical around the nucleus for this whole sublevel? Where, where would it have to be? No symmetry experts here. We have all the possible quadrants. Then we have the x-axis and the y-axis. The only thing missing is the z-axis. So there's one more orbital that points its electron probability on the z-axis. And then actually for perfect symmetry for all five orbitals, it actually has a donut shape or ring of electron probability around it. This guy's called the 3dz squared. So these five orbitals constitute a d sublevel and they actually allow 
the uh, electrons to be arranged perfectly symmetrical around the nucleus. When I said that the d orbitals are always four-leaf clover shaped, I had my fingers crossed because that was actually a lie. This last one doesn't look like a four-leaf clover. It's a little bit different. It looks like a p orbital with a donut. But approximately the shape of these d orbitals are four-leaf clover shaped. So those are all the orbitals that make up the third energy level of an atom. The fourth energy level, as we talked about in our little chart before, must have four sublevels, the S, the P, the D, and the F. The S sublevel always has one orbital. The P sublevel always has three orbitals. The D sublevel always has five orbitals. And the F sublevel always has seven. That adds up to 16 orbitals altogether. If you multiply by two, that's why we know the fourth energy level can hold 32 electrons. And so what are the names of the orbitals in this fourth energy level? I'm not going to draw all the pictures. I'm just going to name them. But there's going to be a 4s orbital. There's going to be a 4px, 4py, 4pz. There'll be a 4dxy, 4dxz, 4dyz, 4dx squared minus y squared, and 4dz squared. So without writing out the names specifically, there'll be one 4s orbital, three different 4p orbitals, five of the different 4D orbitals, and then finally we'll have the seven different 4F orbitals, which just if you want to see them once in your life, they kind of look like this. Here's how I describe their shapes to you. I describe them as eight leaf clover shapes, but that's not always true. You got some that looks like little kind of hexagon shapes, and you got this one down, it looks like a P orbital with a double donut going around it. So the shapes are all over the place, but I just generically said eight leaf clover, so I sort of lied about that as well. But these are what the, the 4F orbitals actually look like, and you can look them up on Wikipedia if you want to see what each of their specific names are, okay? So we believe these are the orbitals that exist in not only hydrogen atoms, but atoms of all different elements. And what we want to be able to do now is we want to be able to represent how the electrons are found in atoms. What orbitals are they in? And will you be expected to draw these? I'll expect you to be able to draw S, P, and D orbitals. The, the F orbitals, I will not expect you to be able to draw. Okay? So if you have atoms that have electrons, what orbitals are the electrons in? I'm going to give you three ways to indicate how the electrons are found in atoms and what orbitals you find them in. And the first is called orbital notation. And orbital notation uses a dash to represent an orbital and an arrow to represent an electron. So if we start with hydrogen, which from the periodic table has that one in its block, which means it has only one electron, that one electron will be drawn as a single arrow. And you want to put it in the most likely orbital it's going to be in. Out of all these orbitals we've talked about, the one that's closest to the nucleus is the 1s orbital. So you draw a dash, label it 1s, and you draw an arrow above it. That says one electron in the 1s orbital. That would be our orbital notation for a hydrogen atom. Now on the periodic table, if you look at the element helium in its box, it says a number two at the top. That means helium atoms have two protons and two electrons. So helium's orbital notation needs to have two arrows in it. And fortunately, two electrons can fit in the 1s orbital. So I'm only going to draw the 1s orbital again. I'm going to draw two arrows in it. But how am I going to draw the second arrow? Going down. Yes, because the electrons have to be spinning in opposite directions to be in the same orbital. So this would be the orbital notation for a helium atom. Okay? That's how you want to do that on the test. You wouldn't want to do it like, I don't know, you ever get these packages from Amazon? You look at that, they've got the electron orbital notation for helium written right on the package there, and I don't know what they're doing. They've got the electrons spinning in the same direction. So if you wind up doing that on the test, then I will forward your name to Jeff Bezos, and he can... Uh, get you a job at the, one of the Amazon distributing centers because maybe that's where you belong if you do it like that, right? So helium has two electrons in the same orbital that are spinning in opposite directions. We have a special name for that. That's called an electron pair. It's two electrons of opposite spin in the same orbital. So helium has an electron pair. The next type of uh, electron arrangement I want you to be familiar with is called electron configuration notation a little bit more streamlined. All you do is you name the sublevel that contains electrons and do a right superscript to tell how many electrons are in that sublevel. So hydrogen only has electrons in the 1s sublevel and it has one electron in that. So you write it 1s with a superscript 1 and that's read 1s1. 
Helium only has electrons in the 1s sublevel, but there are two of them. So you write 1s and you put a superscript 2. Don't read that 1s squared. That's read 1s2. But these are electron configuration notations. Okay. The third notation I want you to be familiar with is electron dot notation. This is the simplest of all. You write the symbol of the element. In this case, we're going to write H or HE. And you put a dot for each electron. So for hydrogen, you write H and you write a dot next to it. Okay, you can put the dot on the right, the left, the top or the bottom, doesn't matter, that would be fine. For helium, you write HE and you put two dots and you can put top, bottom, left, right, but if they're in the same orbital, they have to go together. So helium's dot notation has to have two dots together. You can put them on the right, on the left, on the top, on the bottom, I don't care, but they have to be together, okay? Now, if what I just told you was true, you should be going, hmm, what if I wanted to do uranium? Uranium has a number of 92 in the periodic table. So I'm gonna do U and I'm gonna draw 92 dots. That's stupid. What if I wanted to do Neptunium, it was 93 dots. I can't tell the difference between 92 and 93. Nobody can, that's ridiculous. So I actually lied. You don't put a dot for every electron in the atom. You only put a dot for every electron in the atom's highest occupied energy level. We call those valence electrons. So valence electrons are the electrons in an atom's highest occupied energy level. And those are the electrons you draw in your dot notation. So electron dot notation only shows valence electrons. Now on the periodic table, you may notice that hydrogen and helium are the only two elements in the first row. We call that the first series of elements. So we've actually done the three different notations for the first series elements. I want to go down to the second series and see if we can draw these three notations for all the elements in the second row of the periodic table, starting with lithium and going all the way to neon. So we're going to complete a big old table for all the elements in the second row of the periodic table, lithium down to neon, and we're going to draw their orbital notation, their electron configuration notation, and their electron dot notation. So to do this, you've got to use the box on the periodic table, see what the number is in there for that element. Lithium's number is three. That means it has three protons and three electrons. So the electrons are going to fill the orbitals closest to the nucleus first. So the first two electrons and lithium would go into the 1s orbital. But once that's filled, now the electrons have no place else to go. So they have to go into the next best place, which would be the second energy level. And when you go to the second energy level, you have two different sublevels, and it turns out the electron preferentially goes into the 2s orbital as opposed to going into one of the 2p orbitals. And you may have learned this before, but you may not know why, because in all reality, that last electron should be able to go into either a 2s or a 2px or a 2py or 2pz, because all those orbitals are in the second energy level, which means they're the same average distance from the nucleus, it should be equally probable for them to go into any one of those, but we know it goes into the 2s. There's got to be an explanation for that. We're going to try to get to that before the period's over. The electron configuration notation names the sublevels that hold electrons. You'd have to say 1s and 2s, and you put superscripts for each of those. So it's 1s2, 2s1. That'd be the electron configuration notation for lithium. And in the dot notation, I'm not going to draw Li with three dots because lithium has now its electrons in two different energy levels. You only draw the electrons in the highest energy level. There's only one. So the dot notation for lithium has only one dot. That's kind of a key. If you're not seeing this clearly, you would put three dots for lithium, okay? Now, as we go down the, the list here, the elements increase the number of electrons by one. So beryllium has four electrons instead of three. So there's still room in the 2s orbital. The second electron will spin pair. So we would say a beryllium atom has two electron pairs, one in the 1s, one in the 2s. Its electron configuration notation would be 1s2, 2s2, and its dot notation would be two electrons in the second energy level in the same orbital pair of dots. They have to be together, okay? Boron has one more electron, but the 2s sublevel is filled, so now it's going to have to put its final electron in one of the 2p orbitals. And when you finally move to a new sublevel, if there's multiple orbitals, even if they're not filled, you have to draw all of them because somebody has to be able to look at this and see whether they're looking at an S sublevel or a P sublevel. Notice I've got the S sublevel separated there, so you can tell that's a group of one. 
this 2S sublevel separated, it's a group of one, but then I clump those together, that's how people look at this and go, oh, that's a P sublevel. So you just put an electron in one of the three orbitals, okay? Uh, Mr. De La Cruz may be the rugged individualist, you might want to put it over here in the last one instead of the first, just to stick it to the man, but it doesn't matter. As long as you have one electron in one of those three, that would be perfectly fine. Then the uh, electron configuration notation would be 1s2, 2s2, and then you say 2p1. And here's where we'll miss the dot notation because a lot of times we'll get boron with one dot, which is wrong. You don't put a dot for every electron in the highest sublevel. You put one dot for every electron in the highest energy level. That's the two here. Both of these are in the highest energy level. That's one, two, three, three dots. These have to be paired. This one has to be by itself. So it's a pair and a single. That's the trickiest one on here, okay? If you understand that concept though, this won't be so bad. Now, when you go to carbon, one more electron can either go in this orbital here and pair up or can go in one of the other two orbitals. Do you know which way that's gonna go? Will carbon put its last electron in the same orbital here or is it gonna put it in one of the other ones? What do you remember? It would put it in another one because you can't go down. So, <clears throat> If, if it was gonna go in here, it would go down. So you could actually do that. What would be the advantage of putting it in? Why would the electron rather go in this orbital than go in this orbital? What's the, what would be a reason for that? It's further away from the other electrons. And what do electrons do to each other? Repel. Exactly. So if you're the second electron, do you want to go in that same orbital and repel against that guy? Or do you want to have your own orbital? If there are orbitals of equal energy, the electrons will always stay spread out to minimize their repulsion. That's why the next electron in carbon takes its own unique orbital. Perfect. So the configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And then watch the dot notation. What's in, this, what's in the highest energy level? A pair, so you put two dots together. And are these together? Don't make a second pair. It's a pair and then two singles. Does that make sense? Four singles is wrong. Two pairs is wrong. It's a pair and two singles because that's how the electrons go. When you get to nitrogen, because the electrons repel, the same thing that Mr. Gomez just told us is gonna apply here. That third electron is gonna take its own unique orbital and its orbital notation will look like this. Electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And the dot notation will be a pair, single, single, single. Okay. Now when we get to oxygen. Now the electrons have to finally fill these last spots so they will pair up. So oxygen will put its last electron in any one of those three orbitals. And was already mentioned, they have to spin pair. So it's gotta be upside down the electron configuration notation, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, and then watch the dot notation. You have a pair from the 2s. You now have a pair in the 2px, but you have singles in the 2py and 2pz, so it's gotta look like this. So the oxygen atom has one, two, three electron pairs, and then a couple of single electrons, okay? And I think the rest then would be fairly easy. Fluorine would put its next electron in the next of the p orbitals, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, and the dot notation would be electron pair, electron pair, electron pair, and then a single. And then neon fills out the p sublevel, so it looks like this. And that would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and the dot notation would have pair, 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 pair. Okay, those are all the elements in the second row on the periodic table. The dot notation, remember, was only for the valence electrons, the electrons in the highest occupied energy level. So that was these. These are the ones in the second energy level. Any electrons that are not valence electrons and are therefore in lower energy levels, we have a name for those. Those are called core electrons. So the dot notation does not show the core electrons. The dot notations only show the valence electrons. Now, I wanna go back and talk about why electron in the second energy level went into an s orbital go into a p orbital okay because we need to understand why that is 
If I just look at the element boron, boron has a pair of electrons in the 2s and one in the 2p. How come those three electrons didn't go one and one and one, or maybe the three electrons went into the 2p and nobody was in the 2s? Why does the 2s fill before the 2p? That's the question. Well, it must be, I'm saying scientists would go, well, because the 2s orbital is more stable than the 2p for some reason. The 1s fills first because it's the lowest in energy. It has the most attraction because it's the smallest. The 2s must be the next most stable because it's filling second. And for some reason, the 2p orbitals must be higher in energy, so they fill last. Shouldn't be that way. According to the Schrodinger equation, the 2s and 2p orbitals are actually identical in energy because of the same average distance from the nucleus. So why are their energies different here? Why is the 2s filling before the 2p? Well, let's take a look at some of these orbitals here. Here's the radial probability distribution of the 1s orbital. It kind of looks like this. The electrons are spending a lot of time near the nucleus because it's a small orbital and the radial probability distribution is going to wind up looking like this. Zero probability at the nucleus, high probability in the orange region, and then it goes down to zero as you get further and further away. The 2s orbital is going to have a radial probability distribution like this. Zero probability at the nucleus, a little bit close, then a nodal plane, then a little bit more. If we graph it on it, it's going to look like this. Okay. So we can explain why the 1s fills before the 2s, because if you're in this gray orbital, you're spending most of your time close to the nucleus. If you're in the 2s orbital, it looks like you're spending most of your time way out further away, so you don't attract as much. So that's why the 1s fills before the 2s, okay? But what about the 2p? If I draw a radial probability distribution with the 2p, it looks like this. And I mean, you might think, oh, maybe that 2p orbital has more probability, is a actually on the average closer to the nucleus. But if you average out this hump with the second hump of the 2s, these two humps averaged out, turn out to be exactly the same average distance as the 2p, so they appear to be identical to each other. Why is that flipping 2s filling first? And the reason it is, is it has to do with the 1s electrons. Those 1s electrons, which are close to the nucleus, are blocking the nuclear charge from electrons in the second energy level and that's causing the two S's to fill before the two P's, okay? Now, I was considering inviting you all down to Dana Point Harbor to the beach on Baby Beach there, and we we're gonna have a, a bonfire, but that's all rainy and so that we're not gonna be able to do that, so that got canceled for tonight. But if we're gonna do that, it's gonna be cold down there anyway, right? And so if you showed up to the bonfire, you'd all be huddled around the fire because you wanna stay warm. What if Mr. Filippo shows up like 10 minutes late and he comes up there and goes, oh my gosh, it's so cold out here. I need to get to the fire to feel warm. And he pops himself in front of you. How are you guys going to feel now with him standing between the fire and you? Man. You're going to get cold, right? So that's what the 1S electrons are doing to the electrons in the second energy level. They're blocking the new charge from the second energy level electrons. So the second energy electrons don't feel the nuclear charge. So what would you guys do back here if you're standing behind him? Well, one of you go, enough of this. I'm going to walk in front of Mr. DiFilippo. <laughs> oh, now, and then go back. Another guy will walk him in front. Oh, I'll spend some time in front of him to get warm, and then I can go back. Well, look at this. I want you to focus in on this part of the uh, radial probability distribution. See what the dotted red line is? This is the average distance of the 1s electrons. Look what the 2s and 2p electrons can do. They can go inside the 1s electrons. It's like you walking in front of Mr. Filippo here. So if we focus in on that little region down there, see which orbital has more probability inside the shielding? The 2s does. So because it has more probability inside the shielding, it's more stable. It fills first. That's why the 2s fills before the 2p. So you have to understand that the 1s electrons in the gray there are shielding or blocking or shielding the 2s and 2p electrons from the nuclear charge. They say the word shielding, but you want to think of blocking because that might make better sense to you. They're blocking the 2s and 2p electrons from the nuclear charge. So the 2s and 2p electrons have to move in front of the 1s's for a while just to feel the nuclear attraction. So you have to go which one goes inside of the 1s electrons more and from the radial probability distribution, it's the 2s. 
So the 2s electrons have a greater probability of being inside the shielding. So they're more attracted to the nucleus. So that makes them more stable than the 2p electrons. Okay. So that's the reason when you're doing the orbital notation, you always, when you get to the second energy level, you fill the 2s first. And then when it's filled, then the electrons go into the 2p. If you go to the third energy level, the same phenomenon happens. You would fill the 3s first. Then all the three P's would fill, and then the P's, which are the most last, any energy level, S orbitals are always the most stable because they have more probability inside the sheet. Then it's then D, F's, etc. Okay. So that explains that phenomenon. I want to talk about the other phenomenon when we got to carbon. And carbon had two electrons in the 2p sublevel, but the electrons did not pair up. So we got the answer to that right, but I just want to officially write it down for you now. Carbon has its two electrons in the 2p sublevel separated. There's a name for that. It's actually called Hund's rule. It's when occupying orbitals of equal energy, when two electrons are going to be in orbitals of equal energy, electrons remain unpaired as long as possible. And why is that? That was a Mm, Mr. Gomez's answer to that, to minimize their repulsion. So when orbitals of equal electrons remain aired as long as possible. Orbitals of equal energy are orbitals like in the P sublevel, orbitals in the e sublevel, or orbitals F sublevel. We have a name for orbitals It's a different connotation when you apply it to people, but for orbitals, it means equal energy. So the 2px, 2py, 2pz all have equal energy. And so that determines the order in which electrons fill the p level. They go one, then one, then one in the three separate orbitals and they pair up, pair up, pair up. So if you notice the dot notations, we were drawing elements in the second row on the periodic. The first two dots always went together. Why is that? You fill the s sublevel first. After that, P orbitals split up the electrons. So look where the third electron goes by itself. Fourth goes by itself, by itself. And then you finally go sixth, seventh, and eighth. So that's the order the dot notation will always go in. When we got to neon at the very end of the second row, notice neon had eight electrons in its outer shell. It's a name that's called an octet. Octet is an electron arrangement in which the S and P sublevels are filled in an energy level of an atom. <clears throat> now, if we move to the third row on the periodic table, and I'll do a couple little elements here. The third row starts with sodium. <clears throat> and I want to draw the electron configuration notation and the electron dot notation. I'm not going to do the orbital notation. In its box on the periodic table, sodium's number is 11. It has 11 electrons. The first two would go in the 1s. The next two would go in the 2s. The next six would go in the 2p. That adds up to 10. Sodium has 11 electrons. It needs one more. That has to go to the third energy level, and it's preferentially going to go in the 3s orbital. So the electron configuration notation for sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. What would be the dot notation for a sodium atom? Na with one dot. Perfect, because its highest occupied energy level is the third energy level, and it only has one electron in it. The next element in this series is magnesium, has one more electron. That other electron can fit in the 3s sublevel, so it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. And because magnesium has two electrons in its highest occupied energy level, which is the third energy level, it would be two dots, and you have to put them together because they're in the same orbital. Now, once the 3s sublevels filled, any additional electrons will now have to go into the 3p sublevel. So aluminum is going to wind up putting its last electron in a 3p sublevel. So its configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. And then when you draw the dot notation, make sure you're not drawing one dot. It's not for the electrons in the highest sublevel. It's electrons in the highest energy level. So you have to count all the electrons in the third energy level, a pair in the s and then one in the P, if that makes sense, okay? <clears throat> if we work our way all the way to the very end of the third period, we get to the element argon, and argon's gonna wind up having six electrons 
in the 3p sub level. So argon is going to wind up looking like this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. It has eight electrons in the third energy level. The dot notation would therefore have eight dots, and that's what we call an octet. Okay, that's the last element in the third row. The last one I want to do today is the first element in the fourth row, which is potassium. Potassium should be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d1, because there's still one more sublevel in the third energy level. But it's not. Potassium does not put its last electron in the 3d sublevel. It puts it in the 4s sublevel instead. It skips the 3d sublevel. <clears throat> Therefore, what's its dot notation? The new highest energy level is the fourth energy level, so it's only going to be one dot. Why does it do that? Okay, let's take a look at a 3D orbital and compare it to a 4S orbital. 3D orbital is four-leaf clover in shape, looks like this. A 4S orbital is round in shape or spherical, so I'll draw a sphere, but how am I going to draw it relative to this? What's true about the 4S orbital compared to the 3D? What's different about them? Besides the shape, 3D, 4S, what's different? Oh, I lost the chat, let's see. It is larger because electrons in the fourth energy level are bigger than, than orbitals in the third energy level. So here's the shape of a 3D orbital, here's the shape of a 4S, but because the fourth energy level is a higher number than the third energy level, it's going to be a bigger shaped orbital, okay? So watch this. <clears throat> Here is the radial probability distribution of a 3D orbital. Average distance, right here. Here's the radial probability distribution of the 4S. Average distance way out here. That 4S orbital seems to be way further from the nucleus. It shouldn't fill first. The 3D on the average is closer to the nucleus. So why is the 3D not filling first? It's because of electrons in the first and second energy levels. Let me draw where the first and second energy level electrons are. So a 3D orbital from our picture on the average is closer to the nucleus in a 4S orbital. But here's where the first and second energy level electrons are. And what do you notice right here? Oh my gosh, the 4S orbital has more probability inside the shielding. So even though on the average the 4S is further from the nucleus, the 4s orbital has more probability inside the shielding, so it's more stable. That's why the 4s fills first. 